Hello, everyone. So welcome to our first capacity building webinar for the 2022 Rare Disease Day campaign. I'm Lara Chapel, Communications and Marketing Director at Eurodis. Eurodis coordinates Rare Disease Day with the global community of people living with a rare disease. May I say from all the team working on Rare Disease Day here, um, so Davor is here with me today, Davor. Um, so he's our web technology manager, and we're missing Pamela and Izzy online today, but they were both very involved in the prep, and I thank them. So from all the team at Eurodis Rare Diseases Europe, we are so excited to be here launching the 15th Rare Disease Day. As a reminder, everyone can participate in raising awareness, and each and every one of you can make a difference in people's lives. Today, you're over 100 participating in the event in Zoom from over 20 countries around the world. We'll be together for two hours. So for those in North and South America, go ahead and serve your morning coffee or tea. Um, in Europe and Africa, it's more of an after lunch break. So um, sit back, learn and prepare your questions. And in Asia and Australia, I know it's quite late, but just hang in there. We have a great agenda ahead. So we're going to start um, with a bit of an introduction and some housekeeping tips. So first, um, today we'll be giving tips about using Rare Disease Day to advance your local advocacy objectives. So as I was saying, first the introduction with uh, Davor and myself. And if we can, I'll stop sharing so we can see all of our speakers. Um, as always in our webinars, we have four speakers. Um, our external expert speaker, I feel very fortunate today to have you with us, Jess. Thanks um, so much for taking the time for the Rare Disease Day community. Jess is Managing Director of Healthcare and Wellness from Hill and Knowlton Strategies a consulting firm, and she has so kindly agreed to share her wealth of knowledge and experience with us to give some tips about how to help you get started or maybe tweak a bit of your plans for pushing your advocacy objectives. Then we'll hear from three case studies. Each case study is um, from a different continent. We have Anna Cole um, from Europe, from one of my colleagues here at Eurodis. Thank you, Anna. Then we'll hear from um, Amira Amada. She's um, from Brazil. And Kristen Angel um, from the US. So thank you all for taking the time to share your experience for our group today. All three of our case studies have multiple years of experience working in advocacy and rare diseases. So this will be super to see some real life examples which are in progress or have already proven successful. We'll start with a bit. So here we go with our little update. I need to share my screen again. So bear with me as I go back to these slides. Yes, and this was our, our agenda. And I'm going to leave it, hand it over to you, Davor. Yes, so a warm welcome from me as well. And just a couple of uh, housekeeping bits. Uh, so if you have comments, you can use the chat box. And uh, if you have to ask any questions, then there's a Q&A box for you. So we will be making sure to answer all of your questions. If you want to ask a question, uh, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. And finally, if you want to uh, send a message, just make sure that you click uh, send to all the panelists and participants so that everyone can see it. Or if there's a technical question, you can just send it to the panelists so that the participants don't see it. And uh, one final note is this webinar is being recorded. So we will be able to share it with you afterwards. Thanks, Devor. So we wanted to get everyone um, started and participating. So um, as a first 
poll, we want to hear a bit from you, uh, Davor. So is this the first year you are participating in Rare Disease Day? So you should see it pop up on your screen. Just type in your answer. So we'll just wait for a couple of moments. And we have a huge number of participants answering the questions. So I'm just going to share the results with all of you. Um, so is this the first time? Yes, uh, is almost a third. Then uh, I've been raising awareness for the past one to three years is uh, more than half of all the participants and uh, the other ones with more experience amount to basically a fifth of all the participants. So this year we have, uh, last year we had a little bit more of the first timers. So we've got some people back and uh, with some experience in raising awareness for today, for Rare Disease Day. So here's a bit of an update again on um, what's happening for the campaign for 2022. So Rare Disease Day wouldn't happen and it wouldn't be nearly as strong as it is today without our community together. Rare Disease Day is governed by 66 uh, national alliances all across um, the world. These are rare disease patient organizations, which represent across all 6,000 diseases in their country or region. This year, we welcome new partners, um, Zimbabwe, Ivory Coast, um, so two in Africa, and then there are new organizations just started in Greece and um, in Portugal. So welcome uh, to them as Rare Disease Day partners. Again, Eurodis coordinates the global community to create unified messages, unified visual materials to strengthen the movement. And we make those materials available on rarediseaseday.org website. For the campaign materials, um, once again, in 2022, we have used real life stories from across the globe representing our very diverse global community. As you know, there are over um, 6,000 diseases with very different symptoms, but we unite around common challenges that you'll find across these 16 hero stories. And we just wanna thank, these are the six new uh, stories this year that you'll find um, information about them as well as their portraits um, that you can use on your materials. And um, we thank each of these community members who have agreed to share their story with the world for the campaign so that we can have um, these tools. As always on rarediseaseday.org on the downloads page, you'll find um, the poster, uh, which is already um, ready and numerous materials. And this year, the call to action is share your colors. It's something really simple for people um, to do. Anyone um, can do, and you can creatively imagine ways to share with others, whether it be hand paint, face paint, or um, portraits like this one with the brush strokes. So um, I'm always amazed every year at the incredible engagement within the campaign and watching and reading all of what's being prepared um, to raise awareness for people living with a rare disease. And now I'm gonna to leave to Davor to give us a bit of an update of the new elements we have for the campaign this year. Thank you very much, Lara. So yes, it's with great pleasure that I want to share with you that we've just launched a, a re redesigned Rare Disease Day website. So we decided to launch it on Saturday, this 20th November, which marked exactly 100 days before the Rare Disease Day. So as you can see here, we're now in double digits of days to go. So uh, it's as good as a time as any to start preparing yourself for Rare Disease Day. For the new website, we've had a quite, uh, quite a lot of new functionalities and they're all about you. So they're all about how you are going to use the website. 
we would like to know who you are, whether you're an organization or an individual. We would like to know your stories. We would like to uh, see which events you planned. We would like you to download our materials, to download our toolkits and use them in your uh, awareness raising activities. And one of the biggest news that we have on the website is we have a localized events map. So once you enter the website for the first time, you will be able to choose your country and then the map on the events near you page is going to show the events around you. Obviously that doesn't limit you to uh, just that country. You All you need to do is switch the country to all or a different country and see the events uh, happening all around the world. And another important thing is that we've had uh, an improvement in, in the event search engine. So now you can uh, discern, discern events by type. So uh, for example, you would be able to see all the events that are happening around the global chain of lighting, li lights and lighting buildings. But not also not just monuments, also the whole light up at home uh, uh, process. So uh, we are. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I thought I was controlling the screen. Yes. So on the downloads page, we have a new toolkit section. Two of these toolkits. Uh, those of you who have been part of the campaign for the past couple of years are going to. Uh, uh, recognize already. So we have an expanded building illuminations toolkit and then the equity toolkit. Uh, the link to the downloads page has been just shared in the, uh, in the chat by Izzy. Thank you, Izzy. And then there's two new school uh, toolkits. One is the school toolkit and the other one is school home illuminations toolkit. The school toolkit is just to start, so we, this is something that we hope is the first of a series of resources for children aged five to eight. And it con consists of a children's story that's translated from uh, uh, an original Serbian story uh, by an author that's living with a rare disease actually. And uh, it includes also a lesson plan for teachers uh, that, uh, describes the activities, but also asks questions for or recommends different questions and uh, discussions with ch children. And uh, it also offers an opportunity to do additional activities like uh, coloring one of the book, books pages. And then we have the uh, light up at home. Uh, so in, 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 in a way of making uh, the whole uh, Light Up for Air campaign more uh, widespread, we decided to do a home illumination toolkit. So the whole idea of this is if you go to the downloads page and you click on the home illumination toolkit, you will be pre presented with a number of ways you can join the chain of lights, uh, the global chain of lights events. And the whole premise of it is you will be able to screen the video and light up from uh, home on Rare Disease Day. We're asking you to do this on February the 28th at exactly 7 p.m. your local time and uh, that way joining the global chain of lights. And also you can follow light up for air hashtag uh, on social media to see activities and events all around the globe. So this is, like I said, a simple way for individuals to join the global chain of lights. And now back to you, Lara. Yes, thank you, Devoir, for it. We wanted to be sure that you are aware of all of these resources that are available for you to use. Um, so not only is it um, available to, for you to use, but you can also adapt them um, in your language. Don't hesitate to um, contact us or connect with us if you have any questions and be sure to post up your events. I want to remind you of our next webinar as well, which will be the second week in January. I don't have an exact date yet, but we'll be sure to send you um, that registration link. Um, it will be more about the school toolkit, but um, speaking about rare diseases to young children. We'll have um, a psychologist online with um, 
experience uh, with children and um, speaking to them. It's also a larger um, idea of talking to them about understanding others at times and also more of inclusion. So we hope to see you also at that next webinar. Before we jump into our um, the core of our um, webinar today with the four talks, I want to hear from you again just to prepare um, before we get all these tips from our panel of speakers. Um, first, um, we'd like to hear from you. What is it that you would like to learn during this webinar? Did you join because you want to know how to plan your communication? to support those advocacy objectives? Is it more about um, what tools uh, to use to achieve those advocacy objectives? Is it more how to target policymakers or better target policymakers? Um, Devor, could you launch that? Sorry, I thought it had been launched. And excuse me, maybe I was supposed to launch that, Devor, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so please, if you could, answer that question for us so we can hear a little bit from you. Okay, I'll just let you uh, let you answer this for a couple more moments and uh, yeah, I think we can share the, the results now. So okay, basically all of the above, which is kind of what we expected, wasn't that, Lara? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we were hoping for. So perfect. Um, and I think that our speakers have prepared around these subjects. So hopefully you'll get some good tips there. Um, and I'd like to ask you also, in your area of the world, if you could launch that, um, Davor, which policies are you hoping to influence? Are you, um, what is your priority right now? Is it trying to reduce time to diagnosis? Is it for research? Is it more on the social policy side? And, asking for more equitable social opportunity, inclusion, is it access to therapies? I'd like to hear a bit from you about what your advocacy priorities are in your area of the world right now. I think the results are very interesting. So I'm just going to share them in a second. And here we go. So very even across all the subjects. Thank you very much for your answers. And now that you have all of these updates, I'm going to Let's see, I'm going to, yes. So now that you have all these updates, I'm gonna stop sharing and you're comfortable in your chairs. I'm going to move to this next part of our webinar um, to the strong and helpful content from our speakers who are here to share their expertise. So I will leave the floor um, for this part to our keynote speaker and external expert speaker, Jessica Walsh. So um, we're honored to have Jess Walsh as our external speaker today. Jess leads the London healthcare practice at Hill and Knowlton Strategies as managing director of health and wellness. Um, she has over 20 years of experience in global health communications and advocacy. She also knows Rare Disease Day very well. I had the privilege of working with her as we hired h &K Strategies for the strategic review of the Global Rare Disease Day campaign in 2019. And she led that research and review and the proposal which was fully adopted. So this review has really shaped how the campaign for Rare Disease Day is prepared and run globally. So I'd like to thank you and your team, Jess, um, for that and for helping Eurodice and the National Alliances 
to continue to grow this most important community-led awareness raising campaign for greater diseases. So I'm gonna leave it to you now, uh, Jess. Thank you, Lara and Devor and all of you at Eurotis. Um, it's a real privilege and pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I have been working in global healthcare comms and advocacy for 20 years, and it is projects like the ones that my team got to do with Eurotis that really sustain us and to watch where you've gone from 2019 to now is truly extraordinary. I just wanted to congratulate you on some of the elements of what you've shared so far, the share, the, the lighting up campaign, the heroes concepts, you're really pulling through some of the truths of, of healthcare communications. This is such a fast evolving field. And I think many of us can feel overwhelmed by how quickly communications channels are changing. And I am here to say, everyone take a deep breath. Today, we're going to share a bit about how you can navigate healthcare communications, what I call the path from awareness to action, because that's truly where the magic lies in good health communications. If we can create awareness and actually turn that into the behaviors that we're trying to influence, that's really the crux of everything. And what's really exciting to, to those of us who work in the field. So thank you again for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, if my talk had a subtitle, it would be based on the game, Two Truths and a Lie. It would be Two Secrets and a Formula. And so someone tell me if these aren't sharing. I have just tried to advance the slide and it doesn't seem to want to go anywhere. Is there something I should be doing other than a down arrow, Devor? Uh, you can try the right arrow, though. <laughs> and uh, maybe if you click on with your or mouse on, on the screen, the, yeah. On the screen yeah. and then Nothing. it will go. Nothing is working. This is quite strange. Let me see if Annette, I've never had this problem, of course. There we go. Oh, great. That seemed to work. Hopefully we won't have that level of delay, guys. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, the first secret I want to reveal is that communications is not just about content. Though people will come to you and say, what are we gonna do for rare disease this year? What should our video be? Can you make me a viral video? Really what good communications is, is a real understanding of who we're talking to and what we want them to do. And when you are a member of a patient organization, it's very easy to get caught up in what our membership wants and thinking about our audience as our membership, while they're part of our audience, we're often trying to affect behavior change with the public, a policymaker, a payer even. So getting in the heads and learning as much as we possibly can about our audience and where we want them to be on the spectrum. So anytime your boss comes to you and talks to you about the kind of content they wanna create because they just saw something amazing, you bring out this slide and you ask them, actually, where is the audience? that we're trying to talk to and what do we want them to do? Where are they on our spectrum of awareness to action? And that should help guide the strategy and the kinds of content you create in your campaign. Second secret is until further notice guys, we are talking to humans and that remains a very tricky topic. The talk I'm gonna give you today is going to bring examples in from the outside world uh, to try and help debunk some of the myths of healthcare communications. And one of the first is this idea that if I give people information, they will do what our campaign is setting out to do. And we love to start with this slide, which hopefully is giving you a bit of a giggle. For those of you who can't see it, it is people at a fitness center or gym, and they have arrived probably by car, and they are not taking the stairs, though they say they are here to be fit, they are riding up the escalator. And that is because people often act a bit differently to how we say. There is a gap between our intent and the actions that we say we're going to do. It's why New Year's resolutions don't work and all of those things. I have this here just to give us a bit of a giggle, but to remind ourselves that 
Until further notice, our audience are humans. And so having a bit of a mindset and insight into how humans behave is really important for communications. In the old days, we thought that giving a lot of facts, the most robust information from the highest status person that we can find is how you, you change things in healthcare communications and advocacy. These days, we know it's much more sophisticated than that. It's part art, it's part science, it's rational, it's emotional. It's why those gorgeous bright colors of rare disease days lift our moods and, and help us lean into the messaging that we're about to receive because they're cutting through the clutter of our dark and dreary day to day. They really lift us up, that visual style that works across cultures, across medical landscapes, across countries is really important to great communications. I said I was gonna give you those two secrets and I'm also gonna give you this formula. And if you do these five things, if you think about where your audience is rather than the kinds of content you're creating first, you're winning. If you remember that you're communicating to humans and so it's not just about facts and delivering the facts in the most popular channel or the channel that you know how to use best. If you remember those two things, you're already miles ahead. And the rest of the talk is gonna unlock a bit of this formula that my team uses and has used with organizations like Eurotis and clients in countries all around the world, public and private sector alike, um, to really affect behavior change and try and close that gap between awareness and the action we're trying to create. And that is the power of a cause, the role of both messenger and message, something we're seeing probably in all of our countries right now as the world tries to increase confidence and uptake of vaccines. And thirdly, this idea of really, how do we close that gap? and what makes a really good call to action. And I'll reveal a few of the things that I was taught and did at the beginning of our career 20 years ago and how much the science has moved on since we've begun to understand humans even better. And that slide I put up about the gym, you know, the study of, of behavioral economics and, and human behavior, behavioral science as it applies to communications is quite new. So it's continuously evolving and really an interesting area to, to tap into and read about as you create your communications campaigns. It does help us understand sometimes why things work and why things don't. So firstly, guys, the power of a cause. What is a cause? Forgive all the words, but I do appreciate that we're speaking to people in different countries and in different languages. So I did want to share with you what a cause is. A cause should sit behind any good campaign. It is a often called a red thread or a thread that should go between and through every aspect of your campaign. A powerful cause and the storytelling that sits behind it will tap into emotional and behavioral drivers. And it actually brings your campaign into culture. So as you create a campaign, we suggest and recommend that you think about what's going on in your local environment outside of your specific patient organization, if that's where you sit. What's going on in culture that your communications can tap into? The more you tap into things outside of your particular organization that your audience cares about, you will become memorable and people will want to engage. It will close the gap between being aware of what you're doing to actually participating and listening to your call to action. It will give you a bigger story to tell, a lot more relevancy. And it's often overlooked because we assume, like all of us, that if you live with a rare disease or you know someone with a rare disease, you will act on it. But go back to the gym slide. Often our intent and our action are different. Some examples of who've done this really well, and this is a private sector example of a major brand in the world, but don't let that put you off because the learnings of Gillette's, the best a man can be, are so strong and applicable to all of us in our day-to-day -day communications. You'll remember that Gillette, the razor brand, had a line that said, Gillette was the best a man could get. Well, in 2019, when we were looking at rare disease strategy, Gillette was looking at what was going on in the world of men 
its primary audience. And they were looking at how the conversation on masculinity was changing and it had become quite toxic. And we were ready during the Me Too movement to hear different stories about how to create a more modern, inclusive sense of masculinity. And Gillette launched its campaign called The Best Men Can Be, taking its tagline and turning it into a powerful cause against toxic masculinity, creating resources and inviting men and their families into conversations about supporting a new kind of more inclusive conversations. It was supported, like many of you know, with toolkits and great content. And it was a real invitation at a time when men were looking for something different from a brand. And it has been a lasting legacy and something that that brand has played with since. A more public health campaign that's UK based was the very powerful This Girl Can. And I suggest in the interest of time, I'll be brief, but go look this one up. This was solving the problem of the invisibility of girls' participation in sports and Public Health England came up with a campaign that really recognized the power of individual stories, like many of us do, to help people realize that they were not alone. So tapping into a, a truth about the audience that people felt they were alone, being able to create individual powerful stories that were easy to share, and then where Public Health England was really smart is that they didn't just consider a one-way approach to communications during this campaign. They took their cause and they made it interactive and they started to look on Twitter and Facebook for where people were talking about feeling left out of sports and actually engaging in conversation. And that's the second learning here is really making it conversational. So a powerful cause will give you a right to engage in conversation much more than um, just having a top-down campaign. Our learnings here from this section really are this sense of commonality and connection needs to be created with our audience even when we face uncommon or rare circumstances, which by nature we do working in rare disease. So what are the common truths? Eurotis is looking at a concept like equity, which so many are concerned about these days. And advancing that agenda is something that's important to policymakers, to payers, to businesses, to industry. And it's an invitation when you sign up to a bigger cause for people to participate with you. If you think about the brand Dove, who is a soap brand, but has really started to own this idea of real beauty all around the world and it's different cultural manifestations. They talk about aging. It gives you a right to play in places that you may have been limited for if you hadn't signed up to a bigger cause. And that's why it's so powerful. When people say, let's make this a movement, unless you have a cause that resonates in culture, you're not really going to be able to create a movement. I am also here, one of my headlines, a cause is not a tagline, right? It, it is something that inspires a movement. It is like a tent. It is both pointy in that things hang off it really, really easily, and it's baggy. It's big enough, your cause needs to be big enough so that different themes can sit under it year on year. And for those of us who've been working in advocacy for a really long time, this should be the thing that really sells it because once you attach to a cause, you don't have to change things every single year. Our second topic and element of our formula for successful healthcare communications and closing that gap from awareness to action is the idea of messenger and message. And I think many of you are aware of this. I often give two examples. One was Hillary Clinton losing the US election to Donald Trump. Regardless of your politics, you had the most qualified candidate for presidency probably ever losing to a phenomenal message. Someone who was able to say it, say it, and say it again with a messenger who was more relatable to the swing audiences in that election. We saw it again in Brexit. And this is license and advice to everyone. Remember who you're talking to and talk to them. Don't talk to the people who are already convinced. Um, small changes to messages and messenger can have a really outsized impact on how people act on messages. I, I've mentioned it before, but we are seeing this hugely in COVID. 
um, vaccine uptake. People are listening to those in their communities who they trust. Think about how you can communicate trust in your messaging. Trust is actually the biggest barrier to taking vaccines. We talk a lot about misinformation and that's partially true. Um, and it has a very important role to play, but really trust of messenger and trust of healthcare provider or person in your community is outweighing any facts or information we provide on vaccines. So think about who you are choosing to give your message as well as what and what you are saying and the kinds of contents you're creating. This is an example from Zimbabwe. They were able to increase the use of female condoms by giving training to a thousand hairdressers across the country. And the, the, we've seen this since the HIV days, the, the idea of bringing in training and support to community messengers is incredibly important. In fact, going hyper-local with your messenger is often, if you can, one of the greatest ways of sharing um, content and actually getting people to engage with your campaign. So just remember on message in message, it's about having the right message for the right audience to increase your behavior change, the credibility of who you're using. And this is why sometimes you'll see people put on a white coat to show that they are a healthcare professional. Think about in your local communities, what is it that creates trust with your audience? Similarity, making sure that your messengers aren't alienating and likability. This is a basic, idea of human nature, if people are really nice and open in their communications and they engage us, we're much more likely to do what they say. Lastly, I wanted to talk about how we do this. How do we close this gap really powerfully? And this is about creating the best call to action you can. Good healthcare communications can really uh, close the gap here when we create calls to action from behavioral science, as I've said. This example comes from the UK, where just minor tweaks to messaging to healthcare professionals changed antibiotic prescribing behavior by doing something really powerful, putting the message into uh, a behavioral driver of people like me. Doctors are often influenced by what other doctors are doing. And people often ask me, surely just doctors and policymakers, they're not influenced by our campaigning, the things that we're doing in behavioral science. They are. Doctors and, and, and policymakers are human. In fact, there's a study of judges that suggests that criminal judges are more lenient on defendants in the hour before lunch. So actually not more lenient, more harsh on defendants in the hour before lunch. And that is because they are hungry. Specialists are humans too. So what we did here in this campaign was we wanted to lower uh, antibiotic prescription in the UK. So we used pen and paper and messaging in this case. And we used this idea of social norms, people like me, doctors are motivated by what other doctors do. And we let doctors know how other prescribers in their area, geographically speaking, were doing. And we told them that Dr. So-and-so in the practice down the road was prescribing less antibiotics. And it showed a 3% reduction in the first three months of putting these letters out to the world for the cost of 8,000 pounds, the cost of the ink and the postage of writing a letter. So it doesn't have to be big, flashy and expensive if you tap into the right behavioral drivers. The last one is one I love to share, which is often in my career, at the very beginning stages, we were always told in healthcare to make the message positive. When in fact, often framing things as a loss has more of a motivator for us to participate. And we know this from companies that give us free membership to something because they know that the idea of us losing that membership when we have to start to pay for it is much less appealing than just paying for it. So we stay. So sometimes framing the loss, what is a community or an economy going to lose by not supporting a rare disease policy, 
that would be a much smarter way of framing messages than sometimes saying the positive. Um, a good call to action is always easy and fast. So this is why you see people saying things like, like, share, apply this filter, rather than tell me a story. Those campaigns that ask us to do too much, it's easy to put aside. But if it's a one step, one motion, easy to do ask in a place where I already am, I'm much more likely to participate. Second idea in recap guys is this idea of social norms. Show people, people like me, put it into my frame of mind. It's something I can easily understand. The hashtag this girl can, any woman who wasn't participating in sports could really see themselves in that. It was very easy to share and tell our stories. Last one is this idea of loss aversion being a much more powerful motivator sometimes than always thinking about the positive. So tell us what we might lose by not participating rather than telling us what we may gain. With that, I thank you. We're gonna have a chance to talk at the end of the session. So I would love to hear your questions. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour. I hope you found it useful. I'm happy to share these slides with anyone or to talk further on LinkedIn or Twitter or by email, you can find me, um, a real pleasure. And with that, I'm excited to be able to introduce the first of our three case studies. And that is going to be asking, I'm gonna stop sharing and I will ask Anna Cole to share her slides. Anna is the Public Health Policy Director at URTIS and she's going to share a case study of practical experience with us. Anna is a public health professional with more than a decade of experience in the field of rare diseases, both in the US and in Europe. Anna currently leads the campaign for a European action plan on rare diseases. By participating in Rare Disease Day, the action plan campaign aims to mobilize patient organizations and individuals in Europe to call on policymakers. And I am delighted to welcome you to the floor, Anna. Thank you, Jess, um, and good morning, afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's on the other side of my screen. Um, so I too am part of a great core team working on this campaign. Jenny Steele, who's our um, campaign manager, should be with you um, in the audience. Uh, our director of international and European um, advocacy and policy, uh, Valentina Buttarelli. And of course, um, our director, Jan, is uh, Lecom, as well as many other members of the team, because as you'll see, this campaign is quite an octopus. So it really touches everyone um, and all of the streams of work that we work in. So yeah, I've been asked to give you a very quick um, tour about our um, this year's European um, Rare Disease Day campaign. And my presentation, I think, will be a bit different than the other ones that you'll see today, because um, for that reason, it's um, an ongoing campaign. Um, and it's a kind of um, specific ask for this year's Rare Disease Day, whereas generally um, Rare Disease Day can, can um, continue with the same theme of, of equity each year. So um, yeah, thank you, Jess, for that great introduction. Um, I think I learned a lot already and how I can probably tweak um, my campaign. And I know um, Jenny and I were taking notes as you were speaking, so that's fantastic. But absolutely, I think Rare Disease Day is not only um, an opportunity to implement some of those um, tricks and formulas that you mentioned, uh, and really um, also an opportunity, which is why we're all here on this panel, to think about how we can do more than just rare, uh, raise awareness in general, but really ask for some very concrete action. So our campaign is very much on that extreme end of your dial that you use. We know exactly what policy we would like in place. We've even drafted it um, and we know exactly who needs to, to do that. So I'm going to give you some of those details. Now, in order to do that, we really need the collective momentum of a whole community. So we've identified our target, but that's why um, the power of Rare Disease Day is really helpful because we already have such an alert um, audience. So... Um, our ask this year uh, for Rare Disease Day is for something called, uh oh, I'm also having advancing problems, um, for an action plan for rare diseases. Now, what is an action plan? Essentially, 
uh, for the last um, more than a decade, we've had a policy framework for rare diseases. As you all know, rare diseases touch all sorts of aspects of life, from the moment you start having symptoms to when you get diagnosed to when you need to find a specialist or maybe you want to participate in research or you need to figure out how to be cared for or care for somebody else or go to school. All of those streams of work need to uh, be coordinated, but unfortunately each one of them is um, represented in, in, in policies in, in siloed ways. So this year what we're asking for is for a new policy framework that is somehow updated from the one that exists um, today. Now, um, the action plan that we are advocating for, shoot, that is very annoying, um, is a, a European ask, but again, the um, targets of our campaign really need to uh, be convinced that this is something um, that is not some that coming from the ordis it's not coming only from our members but it's actually coming from the entire rare disease day community so we're relying very heavily on our national alliances to help us carry along this message um, starting now and starting even a few months ago um, until rare disease day of 2022. Now what we hope um, that you'll all get from this um, webinar and from this short presentation is an inspiration to see maybe how you can have this campaign be part of your events or activities or media for your rare disease day um, uh, organization, or maybe even as an individual, how you can uh, hop on board. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of uh, something for everyone. And now the culmination of our, our campaign, which started in May of 2021, and even a few years before that, as I'll show you, um, it will be coming to a head um, in February 28th of next year. And so it's really the moment where we're gonna deliver all of the support that we've gained, both on this grassroots and on the Alliance level um, to the policymakers that we hope will move the dial. And uh, last but not least, we are fortunately um, riding on the tales of a very exciting, we hope, um, advancement in December, where a UN resolution on addressing the challenges of persons living with a rare disease um, in the world, so at the United Nations level, will be adopted. Um, and therefore it will really give that wonderful impetus for European countries and Europe um, altogether as a union to try to implement some of the um, recommendations or uh, requests in that, in that resolution um, in Europe. So we have a nice context. Now a bit of background. It's been a number of years that everyone's recognized that we need this new action plan. Much like in your countries, you either realize right now that you need a national plan or maybe you already have one and you definitely see um, its strengths but also its weaknesses. So in a similar way in Europe, um, we realize that we need a reflection. Um, and this campaign was preceded by a foresight study called Rare 2030 in which um, case uh, a consortium of partners led by Eurotis, but including academics, um, healthcare uh, uh, coordinators and, and um, healthcare providers, as well as experts in, in a foresight process, all got together to start to sort of take stock of what we've done so far, make note of what's not working and make recommendations for how that can be better. And so all of that work was um, consolidated in a final report in a set of eight recommendations across all of those streams that I mentioned. And I say that because maybe you won't have an opportunity to take on board some of the content for your campaign this year, but as Jess said, we really made sure and we know that whether we get this action plan or not, all of the content of this reflection is true. And we can certainly keep asking um, for all of what's in that report this year, the next year, and probably for the next 10 years um, to come. So back to the action plan and the campaign. We had this set of recommendations, but recommendations can sit on somebody's desk forever. So we want them to become action. Um, and so we needed to, you know, crystallize our messages a bit for, for our audience um, and for you as well, what is in this plan? So we know already that it can renew focus. We are fighting obviously with a number of health threats and a number of, uh, policies in general, not even in health, of course, right, when you're approaching policymakers. So we needed to make them realize what the benefits um, of uh, putting together a new action plan could be. So it will renew focus on rare diseases. It will make sure that what's happening on this European level of policy actually is coordinated and translates into concrete actions on the national um, level, and that it's supported by real budget lines. Um, and Probably most importantly, um, this kind of new generation of, of um, 
of policies that we're proposing all in this one action plan is proposed to be demonstrated in a way that has measurable outcomes. So I'm sure all of you know how hard it is to put into numbers that really speak to people about the, the baseline of all of the unmet needs in, in our communities. We're still unfortunately there and we're still kind of scrambling in the dark, but we do have a lot of knowledge already. And so this action plan really forces us um, to put forward what we know so far as the best line, baseline and try to make policymakers, but also all of the other actors uh, in the community accountable for trying to reach actual tangible goals. Um, and I don't think I mentioned much of them here in, in my um, presentation, but this goes for the whole action plan itself. If you want more information of what is actually in our proposal, I'll be more than happy to give it to you um, elsewhere. So um, the objective of, of this European um, action is to gain momentum from member states. Now, member states start with you, start with your national alliances, but then quickly um, rely on your links to the national uh, authorities that are in your countries. Because after all, the European Commission um, only does things that member states, that national policymakers want them to do. Of course, they're not there you know, to, to give top-down um, laws that don't make any sense in cultural context, of course. So it's really um, a, a ground-up approach where they're responding to national requests. So the more of us that can get on board um, and the more of us can speak collectively about why it's important to have this action plan, the more likely uh, we have our target of the campaign doing something. And just to repeat again, Rare Disease Day has lasted for um, a number of years. Um, and all of that work has done one amazing thing, which is to make people already aware and sensitive to the notion of rare diseases. So they already know what we're talking about. And it makes the job that much easier to go forward and say, remember what we've been telling you for the last years? Well, those problems all still exist. Now we have a solution. And now we can tell you a very easy way um, that you can package together all of those wonderful things that you're already doing in all of these silos into an action plan. And in fact, we are not only going to make the lives of people living with rare diseases better, but we're gonna make your job easier as well. So what have we done so far in our campaign? Well, I already mentioned the target a few times. It's the European Commission. Um, they're of course influenced by a number of people. So I'll think I will give you some um, details about that too. We've developed our messages. I gave you a few, but I'll show you how we've crystallized them even further. And now we're starting to build momentum. So this has been going on for a few months, um, but this is the moment from now until Rare Disease Day where we really try to get all of these actors involved so that we can finally deliver the grassroots message to the ones who are indirectly influencing the commission so that on Rare Disease Day, all of this is a presented um, as a um, uh, accomplished plan. And in order to do that, of course, we need to maximize our voice as much as we can from now and then. And Rare Disease Day is a wonderful opportunity to do that. So in terms of timing, um, this is where it gets quite detailed, but we, we know we have, or we knew already from the beginning of the campaign that we had a window of opportunity. Some of the um, background evaluations of that old policy framework that I mentioned, very explicitly mentioned the fact that um, their uh, recommendation, and, and as far as the uh, foresight study goes as well, the recommendations really from all of those evaluating the currently um, inadequate policies pointed to the fact that really all of this should be reworked by 2023. So we knew immediately that we had this political window of opportunity in order to get our plan delivered. Well, that was the finish line, 2023, but of course it takes years before any of this um, can be put into place. So we knew um, that the commission, as I said, is influenced by member states. Um, and we knew that the three member states that hold um, what's called the Council European Council presidency during the year preceding to 2023 were France, Czech Republic, and Sweden. So we got to work very quickly, um, really honing in on those three countries and those three national alliances as our allies to try to start um, softening the, the ground in order to get this uh, campaign going and in order to get to the point where we could really present our proposal. And that took many, many, many repeated um, attempts at messages in many different shapes and forms. So this gives you a bit of a, of a timeline of that campaign. 
Now back to the target. I mentioned the commission, which you see in the middle um, as one of the, the institution that needs to put this action plan into place. Um, but the commission is influenced not only by the member states, as I said, but also by the parliament. So the representatives of, of the citizens. And so we started um, advocating on, on one level um, to those three institutions at once um, to, to, again, start softening the ground for them to, to be able to accept our proposal, um, but also to hear back from them, you know, and it was a, a sort of informal back and forth to consider how much what we we're pr proposing is actually realistic. Um, now, those institutions, of course, represent um, citizens, and those citizens are often organized in other umbrellas. So you have on the left, the national alliances, but even before that, of course, you have the people who are either living with a rare disease, caring for somebody with a rare disease, um, either as a family member or as a physician, or maybe working in the pharmaceutical industry, but really those who are working on the ground. Um, and that's where the grassroots campaign um, comes in. Now, sorry, just to finish on the right side of the um, schematic. So we knew our target, but we also, as Jess pointed out, knew exactly what we wanted them to do. We wanted them to put in a new policy framework, but not just because we love policies and we love new frameworks, because we think that that framework is going to lead to national plans that of course are gonna be adapted to their cultural context and their appropriate needs, but that ultimately will lead to better treatments, uh, quality of life and outcomes for people with, with living with rare diseases. And nobody can really argue with that. So again, we had to crystallize our messages. All of this came in the middle of COVID and we thought, how on earth are we gonna get anyone to pay attention um, to this campaign, to rare diseases in general, as I'm sure all of you are struggling with as well. The only thing that we, really could do um, was to make sure that our messages were really sharp and to the point, um, which I think was one of the words you used, point, and I wrote it down. I'll find it again. Uh, and overarching is what I is what I gathered, pointy and baggy, right? So they're pointy, um, but they um, are very overarching as well. So here's the three reasons what we developed why you need a new action plan. Number one, there's unmet needs. That just in and of itself is not okay. Two, the policies are outdated. So simply by making them more appropriate, you can actually start addressing some of those unmet needs. And finally, there are policies in place. They're just not working in a coordinated way. So there's an extreme amount of inefficiency that's happening. Um, and if they're just coordinated in this action plan with a few additions, um, then we can not only get those good outcomes, but we can make the job uh, to do that much easier. Now, the momentum that we were building that I showed in that more detailed timeline um, started back in May with the delivery of these uh, foresight recommendations, with the launching of the campaign, and now we're really starting to see things um, come into action. First of all, we succeeded to get one of those institutions that's influencing the commission, which is the parliament, to table or to put forward uh, an oral question. It's an instrument um, that we're learning as we go and there are equivalents I'm sure in your national, regional or maybe even local context where you learn the tricks of how you get things you know, to change. Who is that, who, not only who is the person that needs to change it, but what are the you know, current rules and regulations that, that allow that to happen. So I identified this oral question as a way of asking a question to the commission what do you think about a European action plan? What do you think about the recommendations of the Foresight study? So we're really excited that this week, actually um, tonight, we're all going to, a few of the team members are going to see that um, debate happen. And so we're, we're anticipating at least an initial response, but most um, foremost, uh, an awareness raising moment for the commission to hear our arguments. Anna, sorry mm -hmm. to, just to say that if um, you've got a, you got a, just a couple more minutes, if you can. No problem. Thank just a few you. More thanks. Slides. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. So the next milestone um, is the wrapping up of our grassroots uh, campaign. And as I mentioned, no matter who you are joining this call, whether you're um, in a larger alliance or you're in a disease specific organization, or you're just an individual who's caring for somebody and you wanna take part, we have this grassroots campaign and that'll be wrapping up at the end of the month. And this is the opportunity for us to really pull together all of those emotional, um, but also practical stories that really demonstrate in real worlds, with, with words with real life examples of how having this, um, this action plan can translate into better outcomes. 
And the um, last but not least, um, leading up to the, to the campaign, is the fact that all of these member states will hopefully be getting on board and kind of negotiating before the official um, launch um, by the French presidency, who we already know is quite supportive of this plan um, in, on Rare Disease Day. Um, of, of next year, and they've already um, promised to include rare disease, the Euro, uh, sorry, the European Action Plan for Rare Diseases on their agenda, and to formally present it at their own um, Rare Disease Day event next year. So to get behind the campaign, we have a nice platform um, where no matter who you are, you can uh, get online, and in a few or many words, um, in your own language, you can tell stories of how you think that this kind of campaign, um, sorry, this kind of uh, legislation would make your life uh, or those who you know living with rare diseases improved. And we have just a few examples uh, to show you uh, what those testimonies look like from a number of countries. And I'm, this is where I'm gonna go quickly, Laura. Um, and a number of uh, sort of approaches, if you will but each one um, has a name, it has a country, and it describes really the fact that no matter where you live, no matter what rare disease you have, there is a simple solution to making things a bit more efficient, updated and improved um, with just a little bit of effort um, from the side of policy. So I think hopefully one of my colleagues has shared the, um, the link with you. Um, in the chat, but you are absolutely more than welcome to join um, and certainly spread the word to your um, constituents as well. So in terms of Rare Disease Day, as you're um, organizing events, um, please consider this, uh, if appropriate, as one of the points on your agenda. Um, please consider using any of the reasons that we've collected from your country that might be helpful to just tell stories on your behalf. Um, please um, draw attention for any of the policymakers that you may be in touch with um, about these upcoming events that are already going to help um, give the political support that we need vis-a-vis um, -vis the commission in order to get this uh, action plan going. And also um, consider um, that in planning your events and in inviting your um, healthcare uh, authorities, that even if it doesn't make it on the agenda of your plan, these rare 2030 recommendations exist as you're working on national plans, as you're working on national policies, please feel free to use them um, as uh, reference materials to only strengthen your case to show, look, we're not the only region, uh, country or group that thinks that these things are important. There's actually an entire community across Europe who thinks so too. So that's it for me. Sorry to take a few extra minutes um, and please take a moment as we're uh, maybe taking a break or listening to some of the colleagues to check out this, um, this uh, grassroots platform. Thanks a lot. Anna, thank you so much. In the interest of time, I'm gonna save my questions for the Q&A a bit later, but there was so much in there. I really wanted to call out your multi-pronged approach and the way you were engaging with your end stakeholders early and often throughout your approach. It's no surprise to me that lots of people are asking to have copies of your slides. Really well done and very best of luck for later in 2022. Um, very excited to see what happens next. Um, with that, I will ask you please to stop sharing your screen and invite Amira to share hers. Our next case study will be presented by Amira Awada, who is a lawyer and for 12 years has been the director or vice president of the Instituto Vidas Raras, a Brazilian patient organization. 12 years ago, she was inspired after a friend from university uh, was living with a rare disease. Learning that story and that experience um, has launched Amira on an unexpected journey as a patient advocate for rare diseases in Brazil. Through an effective advocacy campaign, the Instituto Vidas Raras has successfully campaigned for a bill to provide increased newborn screening in Brazil. And we are delighted to hear your country case study and practical tips. So thank you very much, Amira, and the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present this case. Um, so Instituto Vidas Raras is a non profit organization that was created 20 years ago to work with MPS and rare disease. So I'll just turn it off here. And to work with 
MPS and other rare diseases, we always had the focus to guarantee that people would have access to the right diagnose in, in a very quickly way. So this is something that is very important for us here. We have around the expectation to a diagnose here in Brazil is around to five to, six, to five to six years. And our goal is to decrease this expectation. Uh, so this is our mode, uh, the way that we work, we work with ethics uh, thinking about partnerships and transparency. A little bit about our work. And since 2012, we started uh, requesting the federal government to expand the newborn screen here in Brazil. So the newborn screen here in Brazil is a federal program that are the states run here, but they have uh, a minimum what they need, they can need to provide, and that's what they provide. So this is a, a public hearing in 2012. This little guy here is Dudu, my friend, who I met in law school. That's the one that motivates me to start working with rare disease and to start to being an advocate for rare disease here in Brazil. And since 2012, we do a work with the government requesting them, but we realize that we need to motivate other people, mothers, fathers, physicians, and the big um, and the big population. We need to make our campaign became. Um, everyone needs to know what is newborn scream because we realized that people here didn't know what it is uh, newborn scream and why we need to expand this this program so this is how this is what we start to say so now we screen six diseases but we can spend for 53 and we can save thousand of babies and that's what the words that we decide to use we decide to go a little bit more aggressive with the words and requesting this um, expand, expansion. And we launched a public petition to get a million, uh, million signatures so we could do a bill that is that the public can request here in Brazil. So we need to have an amount of signatures to support this bill, but we decide to get public influencers, the media and the society to join us in this request. That's why we got more than 8,000 um, signatures in our, uh, in our public petition in less than a year. So here we have a few influencers that help us with our social media campaign. And this lady here, it's an, a journalist from one of the biggest uh, TV, TV, I don't know the name in English guys. It's our biggest one, like ABC in the okay. US. <laughs> Thank you. And she was the one. She has she has a, a son that could have um, that has a rare disease. But if the newborn screen were expanded, he would have been fine. So, like she said, I killed my son's neurons, giving him my my breastfeed. I breastfeeding him. So that's something that could be changed with the new burn screen being expanded here. So we use this public interest. We use the media, like getting in touch with them, send uh, releases and information about the campaigns that we were doing. We hosted events when we could meet up in person. So this is an event that we put um, influencers, the government, 
and society together to discuss why we need to uh, expand the newborn screen here. So this was in 2018, if I'm not wrong. And after long years, we had a deputy here in Brazil that is not from the same party of our president, but he listened to us. He saw the social media, he saw the numbers of um, signatures that we got in so little time. He saw the campaigns, we printed out everything and sent to all the deputies and senators here in Brazil that could help us to get this bill passed. There was a, another bills that are that were created since 2012, but it was never approved or it not get through the, the, the process of a bill here in Brazil. But this year, the deputy Dagoberto Nogueira, he did a very strong campaign with the other members from the from, from our Congress to have this law, this bill passed, and the president sanctioned in May 26. So this was for us a very good year uh, regarding the burn screen. So we will have the unborn screen expanded in phases here and the government will organize the system to, to screen 53 diseases and we increase it. We could realize that people understand better what it, what it is the newborn screen, that they need to get their results. They need to talk to their physicians and pediatricians to understand why it's important. So this campaign with influencers, with the media, and talking with the Congress was very important for us to achieve this goal. It was one of our biggest missions here. And this is me. This year, we handed out all the signatures that we had in the Congress in person. We sent to through the internet because of the pandemic. But this year, we started going again, traveling and going to, to the Congress. So this is a photo of what we gave the congressmen and we sent to a few persons that we thought that would be important to know that this program would be expanded as the senator, the deputies, the economists, we, so we send it out to them to say, hey, you guys are gonna have this bill to pay. So you guys need to get ready and prepare yourself because this is something that we need to consider when we are talking about uh, public health um, program. We need to think about the costs and how we will talk with the governments how to, to pay this bill. So it's something that they need to understand that we are aware of this, but we need to find a way and we are here to be their partner in this way. Um, so that's what I have to, to present. I don't know if you guys have some questions or you're gonna leave to the end. I speak fast, sorry. You speak beautifully and I just wanted to thank you. I know giving a presentation in your non-native language is a little more fatiguing, but please don't let that be a barrier to anyone participating in Q&A, just speak. Um, I don't know if I'm a little, you're seeming frozen for me. I hope everyone can still hear me, uh, but please don't let anyone who's non-native speaker, let um, words be a barrier. Just say what you, what you can. Amira, you gave a fantastic presentation. I just wanted to ask you one quick question before we dive into the next case study, which is you managed to achieve so much and you started as a non-advocate, you know, how do you keep going? What is, your, what is your best piece of advice for anyone else whose organization may be a little bit earlier 
in its um, in its growth phase? How do you know what to do and keep going? I was telling Laura uh, when we were preparing for this webinar that I had a meeting with a physician here in Brazil that works with newborn screen for about 20 years. And she said to me, I hope your grandkids can see the change. And I was like, I was 20 at that time. I was naive thinking that we can change the world very quickly. And the, the motivation is the people that we can change lives, the kids that are coming, the kids that we have here. I don't have kids right now, but I want my kids to have a better knowledge about things and know their rights and work with people to help people. So here in Brazil, we have a lot of people that can help and a lot of people with good will, but sometimes we need to have patience. When we are working with government, when we are working with bird disease, we need to have patience and keep going. I know it's hard, it took us at least nine years to have this bill pass it and approve it. And it will take us at least three years to have this program established. But when we are talking about public health, you need to have patience. You need to make sure that we are talking with the politicians, that we are talking with the physicians, that we are putting everyone together. We as uh, advocates, from the patient side, we have the power to put everyone in the same table and that's our mission. So that's my piece of advice. Excellent advice, persist, persist, persist. And remember that some of this is a very long play over across gener generations. So Amira, if you would stop sharing, please, that would be fantastic. I would, then ask our final case study, Kristen Angel, to start sharing her screen as I introduce her. For those of you who do not know Kristen already, Kristen is Associate Director of Advocacy at the National Organization for Rare Disorders in the US. NORD is the US National Alliance for People Living with a Rare Disease and a long-term partner of Rare Disease Day. Kristen manages NORD's Rare Action Network program. And there she works with volunteers and policymakers all across the US. Today, she's going to talk, among other things, about the power of a single voice to make a difference, uh, a very common theme in today's presentation. So, Kristen, over to you, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I just liked how the last uh, panelist closed out with persistence, 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 because that is definitely a, a trend needed in the advocacy space for rare diseases um, and patients. <laughs> um, so I'm with the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Um, we're a patient advocacy organization dedicated to individuals with rare diseases and the organizations that serve them. We have over 300 patient member, member organizations within our NORD platform, and we're committed to the identification, treatment, care of rare diseases through programs of education, advocacy, research, and patient services. And this is just a quick snapshot of kind of the pillars of NORD and the areas um, that we work in. We work in policy and advocacy, patient services with patient assistance programs, research, and education. And I like to share this slide specifically because all of these areas involve um, patient advocacy and the need for more patient advocacy. As Jessica mentioned, I oversee the Rare Action Network program, which is our grassroots based advocacy network here at NORD. Um, the mission of the Rare Action Network is to serve, um, to connect and empower a unified network of individuals and organizations with tools, training and resources to become effective advocates for rare disease through both state based and federal based initiatives across the United States. Um, we stand for equitable access to timely diagnosis, treatment, and care for every person impacted by rare disease. 
And I, I know we mentioned earlier, I heard of the, the term movement. So I always like to, you know, define what a movement is. Um, a movement happens when people gather around a single idea or cause and do something about it. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. Uh, the woman in the center who's speaking and, and uh, her husband to the, to the right of her uh, came to an event of ours that we had through Rare Disease Day many years ago in, in Texas. And she had never spoken to a legislator before and didn't really understand um, patient advocacy and the need to advocate on behalf of her son who had a rare disease. So she came to our meeting. Um, she was very motivated by the work we were doing in the state of Texas and advocating for, for a specific bill there at the time. And when we went to our first legislative meeting with her, she didn't want to speak. She was very intimidated. Um, and this photo was actually taken at the end of the day where we visited about seven different legislative offices. And as you can see from her expression on her face and her movement uh, in the photo, she was uh, became quite the pro at advocacy and you know, was able to just by watching how others did it talk to her legislator who she's speaking to here in the photo um, about her son's story and the importance of getting this bill passed that they were advocating for at the time. The definition of an advocate is a person who uses their voice to raise awareness and push for change by creating a movement. Um, you do not need to have specific experience. You don't need to understand legislation and bills inside and out. I know here in the US, a bill could be thousands of pages and nobody has time to go through a thousand page bill. Um, but the most important powerful thing an advocate possesses is their personal connection to rare disease and sharing their story. Um, anybody can weigh in on a policy matter and they all come into different forms in different sizes. You can advocate by writing letters, making phone calls, sending emails, attending events, hosting events, um, participating specifically in Rare Disease Day, we encourage, and creating awareness. So creating a movement, I like to kind of break it down into you how we do it here at Nord in the US. You know, we, we use Rare Disease Day as a vehicle to promote change throughout the year. And over the years, we've had a number of successes and with, with advocating for legislation. Um, but Rare Disease Day events, we create them and craft them to inspire the community so that they want to advocate for change and bring awareness to the causes. Rare disease stakeholders of all kinds, so from patients to caregivers, medical professionals, um, policymakers, attend our Rare Disease Day events, they come to our events to be empowered and to begin their advocacy for change in their states and hearing what the issues are and you know, educating the public and um, lawmakers on what specifically the issues are in the state with rare disease patients and their families. There also is an opportunity to engage with the community and the lawmakers and share their personal stories and work towards improving the lives of rare disease patients in their communities. This photo is a um, great example. This is our wonderful volunteer, Charlene. Um, she is from Ohio. She is a housewife and caregiver to her daughter and husband who both have um, congenital muscular dystrophy. She, start, she attended a Rare Disease Day event back in 2015. And at the time she was inspired to get more involved. So she actually took over planning and executing our Rare Disease Day State House events where they take place at the State Capitol buildings. Um, she was then appointed as our volunteer state ambassador. So we work towards getting a, a volunteer state ambassador in all 50 of our states. And that person really is the liaison between what's happening in the state and NORD and communicating with us and hearing from the patient community, they're building networks and engaging the community. She therefore continued to host Rare Disease Day events each year from her 2015 attendance um, and was able to once again, empower others to get involved. Um, and then she engaged the community members to gather 
um, and make a change. She successfully worked on numerous laws passed in the state um, by creating a strong foundation of rare stakeholders that she called upon to show up in a united voice for change. She was just successful last year in the passing of a rare disease advisory council bill, which took um, quite a few years to get passed. So that patience and persistence is definitely uh, something that she learned very closely, but she was a great example of the, the steps to creating a movement. She was one individual who saw that there was a need and wanted to inspire or was inspired and then became um, more involved with us and we empowered her to be able to educate and engage the community for change. So the goals of our Rare Disease Day advocacy events over the years has been to make it for an opportunity for lawmakers and the general public to make aware of the challenges rare disease patients face. In every, every state is unique. A lot of healthcare decisions here in the US are based um, specifically um, but state policy workers. So we need to educate lawmakers as to the impacts that rare disease um, patients have on their daily lives and their families' lives. So we, we revolve our events around um, educating lawmakers and the general public on the issues that are important, uh, mainly access, high cost of care, um, the, the need for a timely diagnosis. And then we gain support by these events so that throughout the year, as we work towards advocating for change and working on policy, the Rare Disease Day campaign, I always like to say each year, kicks off our year. So it, it takes place in February. So it's the beginning of the, the, the sessions for, for Congress. And we kick off the year by hosting these events um, getting in front of these lawmakers and then continuing those conversations and working with them throughout the rest of the year on policy issues. And I love this map. This is this is a quick snapshot of um, past Rare Disease Day events that have directly resulted in us identifying um, volunteer ambassadors to lead the advocacy efforts in their states throughout the year and implement change. Um, there's been hundreds of pieces of legislation our volunteers have worked on with elected officials over the years. Um, laws have been passed that help the rare disease community and laws have been opposed that would harm the rare disease community. All of these successes are based upon one individual who saw a need and created a movement. And even in some of the states that are not lit up, we do have volunteers currently working on and engaging in their, in their states too. And I'm going to share um, Erica's story. I, um, I simply adore Erica. She is just a, an amazing individual and a great example of uh, how to create how one individual can create a movement. Um, Erica came to us in 2014 to attend a rare disease day event in Minnesota. Um, she was interested in just learning more about who Nord was. She saw an event advertised at the State House for Rare Disease Day, and she came because she had lost her daughter, Chloe, at three years old, to MLD. Um, she'd never attended an event before um, for rare diseases. She was in the process. She had just founded an organization, um, the Chloe Barnes Foundation for Rare Diseases, to, to fund research at the University of Minnesota. Um, she was, as I like to reference her, a wallflower. She was very shy and um, timid and, and very eager to learn, but um, really needed a little bit of a push. Um, she openly admitted that she was intimidated by the legislative process and talking to policymakers. Um, she didn't think that she could make an impact um, or even be able to talk to an elected official. However, what she discovered at that first Rare Disease Day event she attended was that there was a significant need for change in her state um, and that nobody was leading the efforts in Minnesota. She came up to me after the event and was inspired by the stories she'd heard and wanted to help change some of the issues that she had been hearing about at that event. So with some training that we provided and empowerment. And, and she was definitely somebody that we needed to empower. She had all of the tools and, and she, she had the motivation to do it. She just needed a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a push to, to get out there and start advocating. So she took on the role of our volunteer state ambassador for the state of Minnesota 
um, a few years back. And she was a little reluctant because she didn't think that she herself would be able to much make much of an impact. But since nobody was doing it, she decided to step up. Um, and I'm here to say today, she was very wrong. <laughs> Um, in, 2000 worked, in 2016, working with us, she started to develop um, relationships within the state. She was building um, basically just from the ground up a grassroots network of advocates, patients, caregivers, medical professionals, researchers in the state, and just getting them all together on the same page and really building a network. And you know, following her appointment as ambassador, she was trained on how to be an effective advocate, how to work with lawmakers. We were provided her tools and resources to advocate on behalf of the rare disease community to her elected officials. We encouraged her to meet with them and develop long lasting relationships with them. Um, through Rare Disease Day events she hosted, she garnered more support from the rare disease community in Minnesota. And she engaged and uh, eventually developed a 41 member coalition of stakeholders in Minnesota to work towards creating um, a rare disease advisory council. A rare disease advisory council is an advisory body providing a platform for the rare disease community to have a stronger voice in state government. Rare disease advisory council or RDACs for short um, address the needs of rare disease patients and their families by giving stakeholders an opportunity to make recommendations to state leaders on critical issues, including the need for increased awareness, diagnostic tools, access to affordable treatments, and cures. Erica was very motivated to get this bill passed in her state. And in, I believe it was 2018, the bill passed unanimously in both the House and Senate in her state. And unfortunately, it failed uh, at the um, governor's office. The governor vetoed it. Um, it had to do with a budget line item, which we can all understand. And I was very inspired by Erica at this moment. She had worked for many years, worked with a lot of these people in the 41 member coalition to develop this RDAC and to have all of that work just disappear um, and it needing to be reintroduced the following year and all that work to start over again. Um, I think anybody, including myself, could have been felt defeated. Um, but Erica persevered and she said, you know what, we're gonna go after it again. You know, she was ready. They're like, we learned our lesson the first time. So uh, they, they did work. She worked tirelessly the following year with the coalition to get the bill reintroduced. And in 2019, the governor of Minnesota signed into law and named the Chloe Barnes Advisory Council on Rare Diseases. So they not only passed the law, they named it in memory of her daughter, which was just a great surprise to her and her family. Um, and then in 2020, she was actually hired by the University of Minnesota to direct the council that she helped build. Um, and this is a great story of a woman who you know, it just took one individual and she'll be the first to tell you this was not a one man show, um, but it takes one person to ignite the flame and then it takes a group of people to keep the fire going. And she helped build that group of people. Um, Erica is a huge inspiration to me and I, I, I'll close it out with her quote here um, that she had given to a local newspaper doing a story on her recently. Um, and she said, I used to think that leadership had everything to do with a collection of innate personality qualities that set a person apart as a leader. While I certainly still believe that leadership involves cultivating character qualities, I think much more in terms of leadership before the ability to recognize an unmet need in a space and having the willingness to address that need. Leadership for me now is much more of a dynamic process that we can all participate in. Having the vulnerability to put ourselves in challenging positions turns us into leaders. And that statement is so true for Erica. She's doing wonderful. For somebody that had never met a lawmaker or spoken to one, um, she now takes regular meetings with the governor's office and is um, very well known amongst the policymakers in Minnesota, as well as the university. So I think Erica is just a great example of how one person can make a huge impact. And the photo of the large group on the bottom was the day that the governor signed into law, the RDAC and Erica sitting with the children on the, on the ground. And it's just a great, 
great day that that was when I finally got it passed into law. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. What an incredible and inspiring story, again, on the theme of persistence and patience. And I keep having the, the Margaret Mead quote in my head, which is never underestimate the power of a small group of committed individuals. In fact, they're the only people who've ever made a difference. And it was really something incredible to hear that story in detail. So thank you to, to Nord also for, for enabling that that advocacy to, to happen and being the force uh, behind it. Um, what we're gonna do now is open up to questions. I'm gonna turn over to Lara, who's going to let us know the format for our Q&A and we're gonna invite everyone to start talking to us. Yes. Thank you very so, much. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Jess. Um, so we're going to start the third part of our webinar, the question and answer. So um, we have some questions already in the chat. We've got a couple um, coming in from Facebook as we're also running in parallel Facebook Live. Um, I'd like to start out, um, Jess, if I could call on you, actually. Um, I think you had a question or two for Anna um, from her presentation. I do, Anna, and I'm glad I get to come back to talking to you. Again, thank you for the robust uh, amount of information you shared in great detail about what you guys are doing to get the new European action plan across the line, if I can use a sports <laughs> terminology. Um, we're all sort of backing you. And I have two questions in that vein. The first is, as you were working with your team to put that piece of work together, and as you continue to, to get it um, to fruition, what was the biggest barrier that you faced? And can you tell us how you overcame it as a way of offering some advice to others who are looking to create kind of big policy pushes like this? Um, I guess the first thing that comes to mind, there are many, as I'm sure we all um, experience, but um, to build on what you just presented, Kristen, I think the first was, you know, resources and thinking how is such a tiny team going to achieve such a big thing? Um, and I guess what we did, of course, we're building on a lot of momentum, where Disease Day, like I said, that you know opens amazing doors. Um, but what we very quickly did was kind of map out um, the institutions um, and the individuals even in those institutions that we knew we kind of had to um, target. So although our campaign may come across as, you know, extremely big and you know um high level i think that exercise of really narrowing down your main target and a few um kind of who those people are influenced by can really happen in any kind of um in any kind of campaign big small um political awareness raising really it, it doesn't matter as i think you said jess in your presentation so um so that's what's really helped us focus um, the sort of limited resources that we're always all dealing with um, the best way that we can so that we can prioritize. Look, we'd love to talk to all these people, but what do we know are really the pivotal things that can maybe make this happen? I think that's great advice. And if I can just re repeat it, make it as narrow as you possibly can. We are often asked, you know, by, by clients in private and public sector to create healthcare campaigns that make a difference that are achieving a specific outcome. But when we ask about audience, they'll list about three to five, you know, and, and in there will be the general public and physicians or patients, and you've got to push back and you've got to be hard on yourselves um, in terms of being narrow. You want to do everything for everyone. That is everyone's great intent, especially in patient advocacy. All of us are here because we care so much but we have to be rigorous and a bit strict with ourselves and be as narrow as we possibly can whilst still achieving the outcome if we're going to have the effect that we need to have. Um, my second question for you, Anna, is a bit of an ask. You talked about having a small team, but think about all of the people on this phone. If you were to consider us part of the team to get this um, action plan where it needs to go, what is your one ask to the, the organizations and individuals on this call? How can we help? 
I'll have two. The one is to, to um, join our platform. So I think that's something that everyone um, can do. But the second is maybe to familiarize yourself a bit more with either the recommendations or kind of our proposal um, of the plan to just realize that really we touch upon there's everything um, or we've tried to at least that could that could um, mean something to somebody working in advocacy on rare diseases. So there's probably something that you can latch on to um, and, you know, piggyback off of or launch off of or whatever, whatever the words you want to use, but that can help you, um, even if your messages or target or, or um, goals are a bit more specific. So newborn screening is in there, um, but a lot, lot um, more. So that would be my, my second, yeah, ask. Awesome. Thank you, Anna and Jess. Um, I'm going to jump to some of the questions uh, in the Q&A from the audience. Maybe the first one um, to you, Jess, is uh, when speaking about um, issues, one of the questions was, what about the fear of speaking of other issues outside your direct message? Um, do you, is it possible that you might dilute your message? And what is your advice there? That was a great question and thanks. I typed an answer, but really it comes down to, I actually think the opposite is true. I think if you think of it like a Venn diagram and just for anyone who doesn't know that term, that's those sort of maps where you think about a concept and another concept and where they overlap is, is, is a really exciting territory for communication. So if you think about your objectives, missions, needs and your audiences, again, who the people you are trying to affect behavior change in. Where those overlap is the richness where you will find your cause and something that matters to both of you. And the third dimension of that diagram is what's going on in the world. When you start to think about those things, you're not diluting, you're actually amplifying. So it's just a perspective change. I understand. And if you know, if resources are completely limited or time is completely limited, you don't have time to think about a cause or anything bigger. I get that. But this is when you are looking at, you know, a multi-year strategy or a longer term play, that's when you really want to be thinking about laddering up to something much bigger. Okay, great. Thank you, Jess. Does anyone else want to take um, that point? Do um, any of the case studies have the impression at times that there are too many messages and they don't know what order to put them in or how to do them? Does anyone else want to take that question? Sorry, nobody does. Okay, but I guess it's because Jess, thank you for answering that. So, um, so while I'm, another question is um, about defining the call to action. So um, what types of calls to action are the most effective? I mean, I, I'll jump in with it with the first response and I'm sure Facebook will be delighted that I'm playing back their language, but like and share is certainly an effective uh, call to action these days. And some people will think, well, what does this matter? But the metrics that we're able to gain nowadays from people engaging in that way are extraordinary. So don't underestimate it. Don't think it's necessarily uh, an, you know, a sort of the done thing or not that interesting. Um, having Being able to measure engagement in that way is actually quite meaningful as we develop evidence bases for action to submit to policymakers and payers, being able to, to see how, how willing people are to participate is great. Um, I, I just wanted to play back that idea of loss aversion. So don't miss out or you know, don't lose X, Y, or Z is actually sometimes a smart thing to do. How, um, the, the most powerful calls to action are the ones where your audience can see themselves immediately. That's why I love this girl, Ken, because it, it, you know, it sounds so simple. It's three basic words in, in, that can translate into any language, right? It's not a big concept. This girl, Ken, means that I can. And people, whether regardless of gender, you have a sister or a mother or a friend who's a girl, 
And this idea of seeing yourself in the call to action, that's an, so it's called self-identification. If you can do that, that's also a very powerful driver. Make it short, make it action focused. I mean, that goes without saying it's a call to action. So don't forget that you actually need people to do it. Make it easy. Again, don't, anything that's multi-step, we're not gonna do it. So really try and make it as simple as possible. And the most powerful, one of the most powerful things you can do in your campaigns, everyone, is the concept of showing, not saying. So I understand that calls to action are words, that's wonderful. But the power of showing others taking part, um, when Amira was showing us that, you know, sort of photograph of all of the influencers together in a policymaker's office or on a stage, show us people involved in your campaign. Take a picture. Always remember to, to, to document, document, document screenshots. Share the screenshots with permission, of course, of people taking part in your campaign. You will be surprised at how quickly things can build when you are showing, not just saying. So the, the power of being able to show visually what's going on with your campaign is important as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm definitely learning today as well. So that's great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, a question for Kristen about um, your experience in getting attention, policymaker attention. Do you have any advice there? Or... Yes, I wish there was a, a simple recipe for that. Um, one thing I think to keep in mind is, you know, your lawmakers work for you. Um, they want to hear from you. I think some people don't even realize that that is actually the case. I mean, that they, they get into public policy because they're, you know, they want to help the community. So if they don't know that there's issues that you're impacted by in your community, then they're not going to advocate for them. They're not going to, you know, work on legislation that could help you um, by developing relationships with your lawmakers and, you know, not just going to them when you need something, but, you know, they hold a lot of, you know, these elected officials hold um, sometimes they'll hold town halls. I know in the wake of COVID, they've done like Facebook lives where you can go and, you know, interact with your lawmakers and in, in your in your state or even on the federal level. Um, you know, I encourage you to go and do those things. Um, set up a time to meet with them and just introduce yourself and share that you are connected to the rare disease community. Share how you're connected, and encourage them to just take into consideration the rare disease community when they're making decisions that could directly impact you and your family. Um, but at the same time, as you continue to, you know, develop that relationship with those lawmakers, you know, they start to remember you. And then when there is an opportunity or there is something of importance that you're advocating for, oh yeah, you know, Susan from Ohio, I remember you, you know, you've come to my, my meetings or, you know, we've met a couple of times in our office or we've had coffee. Um, that it's, it's really relationship building. Um, it, it, it's key. It's, it's not just necessarily showing up when you need, have an ask. It's, it's building a relationship and continuing that relationship throughout the, you, you know, their entire uh, term. Yes, thank you for that. I, I love what you said in the beginning too about they, they did take office because they want to serve people. So they need to know the issue. So not to be shy. I don't know, Amir, if you wanna add to that in your experience, um, since you didn't expect to um, start inpatient advocacy and your experience with contacting policymakers. Just what Christine said, build a relationship with them. Just not ask for help be there talk with them about everything follow up what they're doing to, so you have information that we can you can give them and you, there's something that we can provide them what we need but we need to be there for them as well because it's a win-win so be the, build a relationship with your lawmakers and not just when you need them be there in a constant way. So that's for me, that's the, the biggest uh, advice, build a relationship with lawmakers and the ones that can make a decision and the big with the stakeholders, you need to have a, a relationship with them beyond what we need from them. So that's what I believe. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in there. Um, 
otherwise I'll go to maybe our last question. And um, this I remember working on the cause um, and understanding the cause uh, just when we started with um, Rare Disease Day and um, the importance of finding that solid foundation that everyone could um, uh, understand and also feel part of and co-creating that um, together. Do you have um, any advice about how to find that cause and how to? Thank you for the question, Laura. And yeah, I think when you find that it's not found easily, so it's not gonna be in a day's workshop, probably, I'm here to say. Um, we tend to look at it in four different dimensions. We think about the brand or organization that we're working with and what is true about you, because it has to be authentic. You, you know, not everyone has the right to talk about everything. We understand that now, right? We only believe and engage with organizations that have an authentic reason to be in a conversation. We also look about what's going on in what we call the category. So um, what's going on in rare diseases? What is you know, the specific aspect of rare diseases that we want to emphasize? And then our third area that we look at, and you know, I'm, I'm giving you under the hood here, uh, the third area is really what's going on in culture. And that's where a campaign comes to life is when you can take your organization, what's going on in the category, what's happening in the world, and then you make it meaningful to your audience. So what's going on for the actual humans, as I said, that you're talking to? What's on their mind? What's going on that, what are they experiencing now today? You know, if I were campaigning around something that was happening in January, 2022, I'd really be looking at you know, what's happening in, in policymakers' world? What's, what's really on their mind? Where are you? Someone mentioned it, I think it was Kristen, you know, where are they in the policy cycle? What other pressures are they feeling from their constituents, um, from other governments, whatever it is? You know, what's going on for them truly? If you can do that, at the center of that is, 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 is our kinds of concepts that you have, you're going to want to ladder up to, you're going to want to be associated with, that will amplify your, your message. Um, so it's a pretty methodical way of, of looking at it um, and never accept when people come in and go, you know what, everybody's talking about X, we should be too. Just, you have the, you have the right to say, nope, just, just told me a, a little better framework to use. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I think um, we're going to close there. Many people have asked um, for the presentation, so I remind everyone that the recording of this webinar, as well as all the presentations, will be on um, rarediseaseday.org. Give us a couple days to um, get it down and, and put it up there, but um, it will be available. I want to thank all of um, our speakers, Jess, Kristen, Amira, and Anna, for all of your insight and um, information and tips that you have given. Jess, um, the call to action cause, but also the insight in human behavior, which is just the most mysterious, but we, uh, that is who we're speaking to, and it takes research, it takes thought, and um, thank you for all those valuable tips. Um, Anna, coordinating a network of people, um, influencing policymakers, and talking about that octopus that you showed so well um, on the slide of all the different um, pieces to the plan. And uh, Amira, thank you for you know these um, different communication tactics as newborn screening. Not everyone understands what it is. There was a lot of informational um, piece uh, to do there. So um, what are those communication tactics, including influencers that you might not think will talk about complex subjects like newborn screening, but they can be so powerful. And then um, Kristen, that, you know, uh, what a super quote um, about leadership. Uh, I'm going to remember that one and such a touching story, even though I've already heard it, um, it touched me again. So um, thank you for all your work and Nord's work um, in the U.S. in advocating and, and taking us back to the basics, too, about what is an advocate and creating a movement and understanding that, yes, everyone can participate. So um, thank you all uh, for all that. Thank you to our audience um, for staying on with us for the two hours and um, write to us, tell us 
um, any more questions you might have are, I'm sure that our um, speakers will answer them and get back to you. So please uh, don't hesitate. We look forward to hearing more about what you're doing for Rare Disease Day as well. Um, as we have um, now, we're, as Deborah mentioned earlier, we're under the 100 days. So um, the campaign has been launched. The materials are there. So we look forward to moving towards the 28th of February. So have a great um, rest of the week and thank you to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.